Let's pray. Father, I invite you to and plead with you to pour out the Holy Spirit on our service so that what is impossible for me would be accomplished. Namely, that this text would be understood and that the world view that is in it, which is so utterly out of sync with this world, would be embraced by everyone within the hearing of my voice, miracle that that would be. That we would understand what love is, what it means to be loved by God and by Jesus in the face of death. So come, grant me to be faithful to what's here and us all to have minds to understand and hearts to embrace the truth. I ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. In the beginning, the absolute beginning of all things, except the one who was there in the beginning, was the Word, our Lord, our Savior. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And from His fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And because He was in the beginning and is God and is therefore infinitely greater than all of our powers to improve upon or comprehend, He was the most important reality on September 11, 2001, and He is the most important reality on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and He is able to encompass and explain and set right the horrors of 9-11 and the tenfold worse horror two years later of the earthquake in Bam, Iraq, where 30,000 people perished in a night, and the 100-fold worse horror four years later when 250,000 people died on December 25th under the tsunami. He is able because He is God to encompass, explain, set right the horrors, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And since He became flesh, became a a man, and died, and rose again, He is able to draw near to every single loss with more tenderness and more closeness and more kindness than any human can imagine, including the loss of Victor Waters on Wednesday. He is God and He is man, the tenderest of all men and the mightiest of all gods. There is nothing in this world that confuses him or confounds him. I did not choose this text for 9-11. I did not choose this text for Victor Waters. God did. This is the next text. We're just going on. And it is astonishing to me what God has appointed for us today. The text is John 11, verses 1 to 16. 
just before this event, you may remember three weeks ago, he was about to be stoned in chapter 10, verse 31. Then he was about to be arrested in verse 38. He escaped, it says in verse 38. He went east, north, crossed the Jordan to where John the Baptist used to baptize. God gave a blessing to him there. And before many days, we know that because of the word now in verse 8 of chapter 11, before many days, a messenger came from Mary and Martha that Lazarus was very sick. So that's the setting And the setting brings this amazing text. And the text is about death, and it's about love, and it's about the glory of God. Those three things. Just put your antennas up. I want to hear about love from God. I want to hear about death. I want to hear about the glory of God. I want to see how these things relate to each other. That's what this text is about, and it's amazing what it gives us and is very hard for many people to embrace, which is why I prayed what I prayed. Verse 1, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. This verse 2 is amazing because it hasn't happened yet. It happens in chapter 12, verse 3 which sets me up to say, so why, John, did you choose to say this about her when we haven't even read that she did this yet? And the reason is because this is the most intense thing he could say to talk about the relationship between Jesus and Mary. You don't get anointing on your feet and a woman wiping your feet with her hair without some unusual dynamic. This was really precious. He's saying in verse 2, he loves her, she loves him, this is significant. She's, this is not a stranger they're asking you to come help. Okay, that's the point. Verse 3, so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And now John makes the point of verse 2 explicit. He loves them. He loves Lazarus. Don't miss that word love. That's one of the three things I'm looking for here. Love, death, and the glory of God is what this is about. We've seen love twice now. Verse 2, verse 3. Here it comes again, verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The love is coming in just a minute. This this verse 4 The first thing Jesus does, the first thing out of his mouth when he gets news that his beloved is very sick is to say, it's not about death, it's about glory. Now we've got all three. We've got love, we've got death, we've got glory. So there they are, and what we're going to do is try to figure this out. What does love and death and glory have to do with each other? I love you, Lazarus. I love you, Mary. Please come, Jesus. This is not about death. This is about God's glory and my glory. That's what this is about. This is just like chapter 9. You remember? And it came to the man who had been born blind. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, it's not that this man sinned or his parents that he was born blind. This is to show the works of God. Same, same deal. This is not about death. This is about the glory of God. This is not about who sinned that this man was born blind. His blindness is about God's works being shown. This is amazing. John is, John is on to something. Blindness Here it's not blindness. It's not even sickness. He's going to die, and Jesus knows he's going to die. Now, third emphasis of love, verse 5. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So I'm concluding John, the writer, really wants us to hear this three times. Verse 2, this is the woman who will anoint your, your feet and wash them with her hair. Number two, verse three, the one whom you love is ill. Number three, verse five, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. We can't miss this. John is telling us, I'm talking to you about love here. I'm going to show you love here. And I stress it just because almost nobody on the planet would see this as love. If, if you wind up leaving here from this service believing this is love, God is at work in your life. Human beings without God don't believe this is love. So be ready to be worked on by God or not. I pray so. John knows that he's going to die. The key word now to show the relationship between love and death and the glory of God is the word so at the beginning of verse 6. I hope it's in your version. If it's not, get a new version. It might be the word therefore. I say that because there are versions that leave it out. When, when versions leave out important conjunctions, you cannot get what the author means. So if there's no therefore and there's no so, those mean the same thing. Or something that communicates that, you need a new version. Seriously. So here we go. Here's the connection between verses 5 and 6. Now Jesus, I'm starting in 5. Now Jesus loved loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, therefore, that's really there in the Greek. Take my word for it, it's there. So, therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was and let him die. He knew he would die. We know that from verse 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. That's what I waited for. That's what love does. Strange. You might think, um, well, it really wasn't so bad because he's going to raise him in four days. So, no big deal. If that's the way you're thinking right now, let me suggest you think about two things. Lazarus really died. Death is no easy thing, ever. Old or young. As far as Lazarus knew, Jesus didn't come. As far as his sisters knew, he didn't show up. He didn't intervene. He just let it die. It was a real death. It was a real loss. Jesus really didn't go and save him. That's the first thing you should think about. Here's the second thing you should think about. John, the writer, as we read through the rest of the chapter, intends for you to see the resurrection of Lazarus as a picture of your resurrection and all of the resurrection of God's people. He intends that. You can see this. Let's read verses 23 to 26 together. We're going here next week, Lord willing, but let's get a little... This is important. Jesus said to her, this is verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So what Jesus is doing is connecting what's about to happen. She doesn't even know this yet. What's about to happen to Lazarus with you and me. She said, I know he, like the rest of us who believe in you, are going to rise someday to, to life. And he says, I'm the life. I'm the resurrection. Now watch. I'm going to do that now so that you'll know what it's going to be like. I have that power. I'm going to show you that. But see yours in his. That's what he wants you to do in this service. I'm going to raise your brother just like I'm going to raise you, Mary, Martha, and you. Which means that the way to think about Lazarus' death is this. The death of Lazarus was real, and it was terrible. Just as terrible as yours. And if you think his was less terrible because Jesus raised him, the truth is, he's going to raise you. You will be raised. And it's only a difference in time. And the amount of time between your death and your resurrection is as nothing compared to eternity. You're not that much different than Lazarus. Now perhaps we are prepared to see and feel the main point of this text. It was love that moved Jesus to let Lazarus die. That's what the text says in the word so or therefore. It was the love of Jesus for his family, for this family, for his disciples, for you. It was the love of Jesus for you because God knew then you'd be in this service. He did. So this is for you. Now let's look at it again so you can see it. Verse 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. Therefore, when he heard that Lazarus is ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And he did not hurry to his side because he loved them. Because he loved them, he did not go to them. John intends, and Jesus intends, for everyone seeing this to ask, now how is that love? It's okay to ask that if you don't ask it with a snooty attitude. He expects you to ask that. How, how is it love to let him die? I would like you to come if it were my brother. Ha. That's a good question. And the answer is very clear in this text, very clear, but not common or acceptable without the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. The key, the key to this, love lets him die because his death will help them see the glory of God. That's why verse 4 is here. Right? This is not about death. This is about the glory of God and the, the glory of the Son through Him. That's what this is about. And since I love them, I'm going to put that on maximal display at great cost to Lazarus and his sisters. A cost that most people do not want and are not willing to pay. You're going to take my brother to show your glory. Yes. That's where many of you are right now, shaking your head, saying, 
I don't think I want that for a Savior. That's where you are. This is one of the reasons why Christianity is hard to believe in for many people. Because it defines love in a way that is so different. So what is love? If love says, I love you, Lazarus. I love you, Mary. I love you, Martha. I know he's mortally sick and that I could come and spare him death, but I'm not because I love you. How, Jesus? Because in his dying, I am going to get great glory and my father is going to be seen as mighty over death in a way he would not any other way. So I'm going to let you pass through this horrible experience of losing your brother. You fill in the blank. Here's what love is. Love means giving us what we need most. Most people would probably be okay with that definition of love. Love means giving us what we need most, especially if it, if it costs you something. Uh, what do we need most? What human beings need most is um, a full and endless experience of the glory of God. That's what human beings need most. Most of them don't know that. That's why we preach. That's why we share the gospel. Most people don't know what human beings need most is a full and endless, joyful experience of the glory of God as their supreme treasure. All satisfying treasure. That's what human beings need most. They need to be changed into the kind of people who will see that and then they need to receive that. Which is why the Gospel of John is written the way it's written. A revelation to your soul of the glory of God is what this text says love gives above life. We were sitting in here on Wednesday night singing our lungs out in a beautiful time of praise and prayer. And one of the songs we sang loud and repeated was the loving kindness of the Lord is better than life, better than life, better than life. And I'm sitting there thinking, does anybody here believe that? Really? I think they did, but many people do not. You can tell they don't by the way they react to death. It's good to cry, really good, because loss is loss to us. Hurts more than almost anything, but not to the dead. A revelation to your soul of the glory of God is what the human soul needs. Seeing, admiring, marveling at, savoring the glory of God in Jesus. When someone's willing to die or let your brother die to give you that, he loves you. Here's another way to say it. I'm, I'm struggling to define love biblically. Not, I don't care what Hollywood thinks love is. I don't care what the television thinks love is. I don't care what you think love is. I care infinitely what love is in this book because that's reality. Opinions don't matter. Reality really matters. And here's another way to say it. Love is doing whatever you have to do to help people see and treasure the glory of God as their supreme joy. Doing whatever you have to do, including die, which is what Jesus did, to help people see and enjoy as their supreme satisfaction the glory of Almighty God. That's what love is. Look at the way he says it in verse 14 and 15. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad. <laughs> it might even sound stronger if you translated Cairo, I rejoice. There are not many places in the Gospels that describe Jesus rejoicing. Maybe three. This is one of them. I rejoice that I was not there. So that, now here, he does not say, so that the glory of God will be manifest. Instead, he says the human counterpart to the seeing of the glory of God. Namely, that you may believe. There are two great purposes for the universe. This is how big this text is. The demonstration of the glory of God in Jesus Christ is the ultimate purpose of the universe. And believing humans. And we know, because we've read up till now in John, what is belief in John? What is belief in John? Chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. Who believes in me will never thirst. Believing in John is a coming to Jesus to be satisfied, to have my soul thirst satisfied with all that God is in Jesus, which means that there really aren't two goals for the universe, are there? There's one. Namely, this universe is about displaying the heavens are telling and the cross is telling and the Bible is telling and our lives are to tell the greatness of the glory of God and the way we display the glory of God is by being satisfied in it. When we treasure him as our supreme value, he radiates off our life, which is the accomplishing of what he's after, which means that our joy in him and our satisfaction in him and our treasuring of him is the achievement of his purpose. So when he says in verse 15, I have one goal for not going, your faith, and I have another goal for not going, my glory, that's one. Up there on the wall, it says, this church exists to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. Somebody asked me one time, why don't you have love in your mission statement, since it's so big in the Bible? If this were a class, I'd give you a quiz and say, give John's answer to that question based on what he said. Give you a minute. Okay, here's what I said. That's our definition of love based on this text. If you will lay down your life to spread into your children, to spread into your neighbors, to spread into Pakistan, a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples through Jesus, you're loving them big time, more than anything else you could do for them, more than anything else you could do for them. The world doesn't define love that way, but God does. And we do. And Jesus did right here. I, I love them, therefore I'm not going to go. I'm going to let him die. I'm going to put him through this horrible four days or for you, it might be 40 years. Because I have something to show them they never see any other way about me. So, the main point of, of this sermon, and I believe this text, is that love is doing what you have to do to bring people bring people to the fullest knowledge of and enjoyment of the glory of God. Jesus let Lazarus die and 
he died for that. And if you think, oh, now you're reading that in. Where do you get that? That he died for that. I'll give you a couple of examples. One from outside John, one from inside John, so that you'll feel that Jesus didn't just go around letting people die. He knew exactly where he was heading. He was heading to the cross where he would die for this for you. So that you could see in this that. What kind of God is this? What kind of glory are we talking about here? This kind of glory. First Peter 3.18 says, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That's the end. He died so that we could know God, see God, love God, enjoy God, be satisfied with God. How many people are there in the world who would be happy to have Jesus die to get them to heaven, even if God weren't there? That's not faith. We're going to God, and if you don't want him, you won't go. You must be born again. You have to have a heart that loves God. Fighter verse from two weeks ago. Blessed is the man who endures trial, for after he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who, you didn't learn it very well, love him. That's who gets life. And loving him means the steadfast love of the Lord is better than life, better than life, which means death doesn't contradict love. It may be his design to make himself so great in your life. You may have been, he may have been nothing to you before the loss of your beloved. Nothing. And you smack right up against eternity and it hit you in the face so hard you never recovered. And you got two ways to go there, bitterness or, oh, oh, oh. I was, a, I was asleep. I was reading 1 Corinthians 15 this morning on the swing outside. And Paul comes to the end, says, wake up from your drunken stupor, for many do not know God. It just clobbered me how drunk we are with this world. Just drunk so that the slightest inconvenience puts us in God's face. (laughs) Who are we? One more definition of love and then a closing exhortation. Love is a longing, the longing that labors and suffers. I'm weighing every word in this definition. Love is the longing that labors and suffers to enthrall others with what is infinitely and eternally satisfying. God. Love is the longing The longing of a pastor, the longing of a parent, the longing of a wife, the longing of a brother or sister, the longing of a neighbor, the longing that labors and suffers to enthrall others in what is infinitely and eternally satisfying, the glory of God, which means we have to have God's help because we can't make anybody value God that much. Here's closing exhortation. Between the death of Lazarus and his resurrection four days later, his family could not see how God would be glorified in it. That would be revealed in four days at his resurrection. Therefore, if that is where you stand today, And it's where everybody stands. Between the loss of someone 
and the resurrection. If that's where you stand today, and you don't see clearly how God has been glorified in that tragedy. Don't give up. Don't bail. God is doing more than you can know, and the resurrection will bring the rest of it to light. In the meantime, trust him. Treasure him. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing, have life in his name. These things are written that his glory might be displayed. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, and from his fullness we have all received in the loss of our son at, at 14. Grace upon grace. Yes. I'm looking forward to this funeral tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to it. It will be glorious. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Victor Waters and the miracle of his life and death. We don't have to wait for the resurrection to see what you are doing, though there is much more to see. And we do not minimize the pain of his loss to say that, but we sweeten it and we deepen it and we put a rainbow in every tear. And I praise you for your sovereign grace in his life and in his parents and his brothers and sisters. And now, Lord, for the thousands remembering 9-11, for the hundreds of thousands who suffered loss in BAM and the tsunami, and for the millions upon millions everywhere who have lost someone, would you please announce what love is to them? Make us mouthpieces of your strange and wonderful Christ-exalting love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.